Cyclohexane consists of two interconverting chair forms that are sort of like conformational isomers, differing it via rotations around single bonds. We've called it a chair flip, this process that interconverts the two chair forms of cyclohexane. And for the parent cyclohexane with no substituents, the two chair forms are equal in energy. They're perfectly superimposable. But when we introduce a substituent, one or more substituents, the two chair forms are most commonly very, very different because the substituent goes from being, for example, in an axial orientation to an equatorial orientation upon the chair flip. In this video, we're going to begin exploring the conformations of substituted cyclohexanes. And here, we're really going to need to think carefully about the two chair forms because they'll generally be different in energy. They'll have different energies, meaning one will be more stable than the other, and we'll want to quite often think about that more stable conformation and kind of ignore the higher energy chair form, which is often so much higher in energy that it's actually pr prohibitive in a sense. Like it's, it's not even around in any sort of meaningful amount because of the energy difference between the axial and equatorial conformers or uh, for a monosubstituted cyclohexane or one conformer versus another more generally. The higher energy conformer is often um, there in extremely, extremely small, negligibly small amounts. Let's start with monosubstituted cyclohexanes. When we have a substituent attached to the cyclohexane ring, that substituent is either in an axial or equatorial position, and the chair flip converts an axial substituent into an equatorial one. That's what we're seeing in the forward direction here. Or the opposite, converts an equatorial substituent into an axial one, and that's what we're seeing in the reverse direction. To make it crystal clear what's happening here, I want to number the carbons. As I have them numbered here, carbon 1, which bears the substituent, looks like kind of the head of the chair, and carbon 4 looks like the foot of the chair. After the flip, carbon 1 becomes the foot and carbon 4 becomes the head, and all the other carbons also flip. So you'll notice, for instance, that carbon 5 goes from pointing upward to pointing downward, and carbon 6 goes from pointing downward to pointing upward after the flip. So after these kinds of motions leading to the flipped form, we end up with a structure that looks like this, where the X group attached to carbon 1 is now in an equatorial position, and that carbon 1 is kind of pointed down, that's the foot of the chair now, and carbon 4 is pointed up. And something similar is happening at the other carbons in the cyclohexane ring. All the carbons flip from pointed up to pointed down, is one way to think about this, or, or pointed down to pointed up. So we've previously seen that this process of flipping the ring is called a, a ring flip or a chair flip since it flips one chair form into another chair form and it's a conformational change. It's the result of multiple single bond rotations happening together, happening in concert to sort of move things around. For example, we can see that this X group is rotating kind of down into an axial position while um, on the other side of the molecule this H is rotating down like this into an axial position. So multiple bonds are rotating during the cyclohexane chair flip process. What we're going to do first is practice drawing the two chair forms of monosubstituted cyclohexanes, noting this difference between axial and equatorial orientations of the substituent in the two chair forms. And then we're going to dig into which of the two is more stable and why, drawing on ideas about strain actually that we've already seen in conformational analyses of acyclic alkanes like butane. Terms like gauche, eclipse, staggered, these are going to come into play when we're looking at axial versus equatorial substituents. And steric strain in particular is another term that we're going to see. For the time being though, let's practice drawing the chair conformers of a monosubstituted cyclohexane, such as bromocyclohexane here. Bromocyclohexane has one substituent, the bromine substituent. Now it does not matter where you place this substituent on the cyclohexane ring. My eye is, for whatever reason, always drawn to this particular position in the sort of rightward leaning chair, um, just because it's on the far right of the molecule, it's relatively easy to see. And I think it's helpful to start to draw both the axial and equatorial sort of sticks at that position, and then decide where to put the bromine. And here again, for a monosubstituted cyclohexane, it doesn't matter where you put the bromine. You could put the bromine up or down. Notice there's no three-dimensional information 
in this structure. This is because this is an achiral molecule. It does not matter whether you put the bromine up or down. You get the same structure regardless, the same compound regardless, I should say. So just for kicks and gigs, let's put the bromine up in an axial position in this first chair conformer. That's going to put an implied hydrogen. There is an implied hydrogen here, notice, in the equatorial position. And let's number the carbons as well, just so we're clear about what happens upon the chair flip. So I'm just going to number around the ring, one through six, like so. After the chair flip, carbon one flips down and is now the foot of the chair. So carbon one is now here. Carbon two is connected to carbon one. Carbon three is connected to carbon two. And again, this geometry can be very easy to get confused by. Um, something about the alternative leaning of the chair really throws people at carbons two and three. But notice, carbon two has to be connected to carbon one. So if you're convinced that carbon one is in, in the flipped form, is carbon one in the original form, let's just keep going around the ring and keep numbering without thinking about it too much, I guess would be the advice I would give. All right, let's now again draw in the equatorial and axial groups at carbon one. Now we have an axial group that's pointed straight down because the two carbon-carbon bonds at carbon one form sort of a downward pointing point. The equatorial group at carbon one is aligned this way, parallel to the C5-C6 bond is one way you can think about this, or equivalently parallel to the C2-C3 bond. Now where is the bromine at this carbon? Well, it was up in the original structure, and what the chair flip did was move it down, but not all the way down to the downward pointing axial position. It moved it to an equatorial position right here. It moved it to the equatorial position at carbon one. And now the H that was equatorial in the original chair form is now axial. So we've done it. We've generated here on the left, what we might call the axial conformer because the bromine is in an axial position. And on the right here, we've generated the equatorial conformer. And there are other equivalent representations of these two conformers. For example, you didn't necessarily need to use this particular carbon with the bromine. You could have chosen any of the other carbons to link the bromine on. We could have started by putting the bromine equatorial, and we would have landed on an axial conformer after the chair flip upon doing that and thinking about how carbon one moves. And so there's more than one way to skin a cat here, but these are two representations that are completely fine of the axial and equatorial conformers. Now the question is, which of these is more stable? We can actually measure this. We can measure the amounts of bromocyclohexane axial and equatorial conformers in a sample of the compound at equilibrium. And the image here shows methylcyclohexane, I'm realizing, but the same idea applies to bromocyclohexane and pretty much any monosubstituted cyclohexane is present almost entirely in its equatorial form. For very small substituents, you may get non-negligible amounts of the axial conformer, but for even a moderately sized substituent like methyl or bromine, We've got almost entirely the equatorial conformation at equilibrium. The upshot here is that the equatorial conformation, the conformation, the chair form with the substituent in an equatorial position is more stable than the chair form with the substituent in an axial position. Why is this? Primarily it's because of strains in the axial conformer. And there are two categories of strains that come into play in the axial conformer. One, is a steric strain known as a 1-3 diaxial interaction. It's actually reminiscent of the flagpole interactions in the boat conformer, but it's occurring between hydrogens or substituents in a 1-3 relationship. So here we have, for example, carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. The H at carbon three bumps into the substituent at carbon one. And this steric bumping or steric repulsion between these axial groups that are two carbons away from each other is known as a 1-3 diaxial interaction. There's also a problem with a gauche interaction of the axial substituent with one of the carbon-carbon bonds in the ring. The axial substituent is gauche to a ring CC bond. For example, if we take a look at this Newman projection, we can see that the bonds highlighted in red 
are gauche to each other. There's a 60 degree dihedral angle there. So when X is relatively large, there's gonna be an energetic penalty there. And even when X is not very large, we're gonna have some energetic penalty associated with that gauche alignment of the CX and CC bonds. Funnily enough, if we change the positions of X and H, or we flip the chair to move X into an equatorial position, we have eliminated this gauche interaction and eliminated the one three diaxial interactions because now X is very far from those axial CH bonds that were causing problems previously. And so the equatorial conformer is quite a bit more stable than the axial conformer. It's, it's lacking these sources of strains. It's lacking the gauche interaction due to the 60 degree dihedral angle and it's lacking one three diaxial interactions. And this is a highly, highly general result. Regardless of the substituent, the equatorial conformer is more stable than the axial conformer for a monosubstituted cyclohexane. Now, that said, the extent to which the equatorial conformer predominates over the axial conformer depends on the size of the substituent and the energy difference between the axial and equatorial conformers. Generally, the larger the substituent, the greater the energy difference between the axial and equatorial conformers. And this is the trend we see if we look at this table, which plots the so-called A value, we'll come back to what that means in a second, as a function of substituent. And we also get the equatorial to axial ratio. And so you can see, for example, as we go from methyl to ethyl to tert-butyl, we are increasing the size of the substituent dramatically and the predominance of the equatorial conformer goes up dramatically from 95 to 5 to 95 to 5 to 99.9 to 0.1 for the tert butyl group. Over 99% equatorial conformer in the case of that very bulky group. Now, this so-called A value is just the energy difference between the free energy difference between the axial and equatorial conformers. So there's some delta G naught associated with this conformational change. This will not be equal to zero because the conformers are diastereomeric, essentially. They're not the same energy. And this historically has been given the name A value of the substituent X. So we could call it something like A of X. And you're, you're getting that A value in this table. And the equatorial to axial ratios were calculated just by using this as a delta G naught and applying delta G naught is equal to negative R times T times the natural log of K. So this gives us the general idea that the larger the substituent, the greater the energy difference between axial and equatorial conformers, and the more the equatorial conformer predominates over the axial one.